so good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's great to see so many people here this morning. Uh, my name is Soren. I'm a second year master's student here at the Douglas, and I'll be moderating the talk today. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Finn, who's going to be giving the lecture this morning. Uh, Dr. Finn is an assistant professor of psychological and brain sciences at Dartmouth College, and she's the director of the Functional Imaging and Naturalistic Neuroscience, or Finn, lab. Um, she completed her PhD at Neuroscience at Yale and did her postdoctoral training at the National Institutes of Mental Health. Uh, before that, she received a BA in linguistics, also from Yale. Uh, so Dr. Finn's work is focused on individual variability in brain activity and behavior, uh, especially as it relates to the appraisal of ambiguous information under naturalistic conditions. So we're very excited to welcome her here today to give her talk about idiosynchrony in naturalistic neuroscience. And so, yeah, as, as a reminder, as, as Miller just said, uh, if you have questions, you can either raise your hand or put them in the chat. And at an opportune moment during the talk, I'll... I'll um, pick those up and, and interrupt Dr. Finn. So yeah, without further ado, take it away, Dr. Finn. Well, thanks so much, Soren and Millar and everybody for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Um, you guys are just up the road now uh, in my new home at Dartmouth. So hopefully uh, at some point I'll be able to come visit in person. But uh, yeah, please feel free to interrupt as I make my way through. And I'm excited to share with you guys some of the work that uh, Myself and my collaborators have been doing over the last few years to uh, look at individual differences during naturalistic stimulation in fMRI. So I like to start off this talk with this quote from Plato, who wrote more than 2,000 years ago, no two persons are born exactly alike, but each differs from the other in natural endowments, one being suited for one occupation and the other for another. Um, so it's sort of no secret to those of us who live in society that we're not all the same. We have our own strengths and weaknesses and idiosyncrasies. Uh, and so the question driving a lot of my work is, is sort of not whether these individual differences exist, but whether we can actually detect them uh, in the brain using the tools that we have available to us, uh, namely non-invasive neuroimaging. And I think there are two main reasons to care about individual differences in this context. The first one is that I believe it can lead us toward a deeper understanding of cognition. And what I mean by that is uh, after about um, almost three decades now of functional MRI research in humans, we have these sort of general consensus maps for uh, the, the general blueprint for the regions and the networks that support various cognitive processes that we can think about. And these are meta analysis maps from Neurosynth where there's in some cases thousands of subjects going into these maps. And these are sort of um, the areas that we might associate, on, might associate on average with things like working memory, language, social cognition, et cetera. Uh, but we also know that these group averages are made up of a series of individual maps, which can um, differ from one another uh, in both subtle and, and less subtle ways. Uh, and so what this tells us is that there is a degeneracy here in some sense. So different brains can accomplish the same task in different ways. And, uh, the, the, the way that this can kind of manifest, so there could be differences in test performance, uh, for example, between these individuals, um, and these are all toy examples, by the way, and so we could see linear or at least monotonic relationships between activity in a certain region and performance. We could also potentially see nonlinear relationships, but even holding performance constant, there might be differences in individual cognitive strategies or styles that people are using to accomplish these tasks. Um, we also know that there are meaningful within subject changes, for example, with learning or developmental processes. Uh, and we know that all of these uh, potential phenomena could map onto the brain in various ways. So there could be univariate or multivariate relationships. There could be relationships with activity, connectivity, other features. But the main point here is that I think uh, by delving into these individual maps and getting a more rigorous mapping from individual cognitive processes implemented in individual brains, uh, we can deepen our understanding of what these cognitive processes actually are and how uh, we accomplish them. The second main reason that I think we should care about individual differences, even in a basic psychology context, is that it could potentially lead to insight into mental illnesses. And so um, the traditional framework, as I'm sure many people are aware, for studying uh, uh, psychiatric or neurological disorders in the context of a brain imaging study is we might take a, something like a trait that we know uh, is, is normally distributed, for, maybe not normally distributed, but there's some sort of continuous distribution in the population. So for example, we could think of this in a, in a psychiatry context like um, trait anxiety. And typically what we would do is kind of uh, choose a cutoff point for this distribution, call everybody above that point a patient, everybody below that point a control. And then if we're comparing them on some brain variable, 
we essentially are just comparing the mean distributions. And so we can see that even though there's a mean difference between controls and patients on this toy brain variable that we're measuring, there's also a lot of heterogeneity within each of these groups. Uh, and so the intuition that, that I've adopted and many, other, many others in the field uh, have, have also adopted is that by treating this trait as the dimensional variable that it truly is, and by sort of putting everybody on the same axis, we can uh, get closer to relating the, um, the brain variables to traits in a way that might eventually, uh, that might better respect sort of the, the, the biological structure of this trait. Um, and so even in, for example, um, psychology studies where we don't necessarily include patients, just by sort of parameterizing this part of the curve here, uh, that might give us insight into what's happening even at these more extreme ends of, of the distribution. And so the hope is that by adopting this more dimensional approach, as opposed to the categorical approach, this could help uh, expedite the development of translational tools based on uh, imaging for things like clinical or educational or other real world purposes. So with those two motivations in mind, um, why naturalistic tasks? Uh, and by naturalistic tasks, I mean things like having subjects uh, watch a movie or listen to a story in the scanner. So these are rich, engaging, uh, scan conditions that we can use. And even though there's been a lot of beautiful work using these conditions to look at what's common across brains. So for example, if two people watch the same movie in the scanner, uh, you might see a, a, a strong synchrony between certain regions uh, in their brains as they're experiencing the same uh, sensory information. You also see some interesting differences. And we know that uh, things like movies can evoke, just like events in, in real life can evoke different reactions in different people. And this cartoon kind of illustrates that. So um, we know that in, in many cases, we can all experience the same event or receive the same information, but react to it in very different ways. And so um, I've personally found naturalistic tasks like movies or stories where there's a lot of rich information being delivered to be an interesting test bed for looking at individual differences in brain activity. So with that background, I'll give you an outline of what I'll talk about today. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I will ask and answer this question of, can we detect stable and meaningful individual differences during naturalistic simulation? And I'll explain what I mean by stable and meaningful. In the second part of the talk, I will talk about our recent efforts to design a bespoke naturalistic stimulus to draw out variation in a specific trait of interest. Um, and in the last part of the talk, talk, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about how we should model this individual variability during naturalistic simulation. So starting with the first part, which is also the longest part, by the way, uh, and feel free to interrupt, can we detect stable and meaningful individual differences during naturalistic simulation? Uh, and this work uh, kind of started several years ago now um, with a series of studies that we were doing looking at individual differences in brain functional connectivity. And I know this is probably familiar to many of you, but just to get us on the same page, there's a lot of ways to conduct functional connectivity analyses. The way we typically do it is to take the brain, carve it up into a series of nodes or regions that cover the cortex, subcortex, and cerebellum. And then essentially for any pair of these nodes, we can look at how correlated their signal fluctuations are over time. And this gives us a measure for just how, um, how much they tend to coactivate. So it's not a causal measure. It's not a directed measure. It's just an observation of um, synchronous patterns of fluctuations between a pair of regions. And so if we do this for all possible pairs of nodes in the brain, we can construct this whole brain functional connectivity matrix, um, which is sort of the basic unit that I'll be working with for the first part of the talk. So we can calculate one of these matrices for a single subject uh, under a single scan condition, for example. And um, the, the first sort of main observation that we we're able to make about these functional connectivity matrices at the individual level is that they're quite distinct and reliable um, within individual subjects. So not only are they stable within people, they're also unique across people. And the first time we noticed this, it was using data from the Human Connectome Project um, back when the data set was much smaller. So this was an earlier release of the data. And essentially what we were able to do was um, take these 126 healthy adults in this first part of the data set uh, and in, in this data set, people were scanned across two different days, uh, and there were several different uh, runs included. So there was a resting state run, and then there were also several different cognitive tasks that people did in the scanner. And what we did was we calculated a functional connectivity matrix, like I showed on the previous slide, for every subject in each one of these conditions, 
And then we asked um, a pretty simple question of, can we just match a matrix from one subject to him or herself on a different day under a different imaging condition? And when we did that, we noticed that we were able to get very high accuracy, so um, well above chance for picking someone out of a crowd based on their brain connectivity matrix, really regardless of what they were doing while being scanned, so resting versus um, any one of these cognitive tasks. Although there were sort of, you'll see this range here, there was some interesting variation in, um, in which specific pairs of scans performed the best for identification, and I'll come back to that idea later on. Uh, we also, as part of this study, wanted to show that not only are these uh, functional connectivity profiles stable and unique within subjects, but they're also meaningful in the sense that they relate to some real world output of the brain. And so again, as part of this, of this first study, what we were able to do was take this measure of fluid intelligence, which was also provided. Uh, this was a measurement that was taken outside the scanner. Uh, and it's a, a variable that, that, that varies even in the healthy population. So you can see the distribution here. And uh, to make a long story short, we were able to develop a pretty simple kind of machine learning algorithm to take in a resting state connectivity matrix from a single individual, um, or rather take in those matrices from a set of training individuals, learn relationships between uh, connectivity weights in the matrix and someone's score on this task, and then use that to predict how uh, a novel subject would do on this test of fluid intelligence just based on their resting state whole brain connectome. And we were able to do that um, with a significant degree of accuracy. So this tells us that not only are the connectivity matrices stable and unique within people, but they also relate to something meaningful about that person in the sense of this real world behavior that we have a measurement for. Um, so I've now told you that we can identify people regardless of what they're doing in the scanner, and we can predict this sophisticated measure of cognitive ability just based on their resting state connectivity. Um, so you might be thinking, well, it doesn't really matter what we have people doing while they're in the scanner. Um, and I think that's actually not true. Um, and so at this point in my work, I started to become really interested in naturalistic conditions. And as I sort of previewed um, in the introduction, these uh, were really interesting to me because they, I believe, represent a pretty strong test of our fingerprinting or identification results. And what I mean by that is that uh, we know from a long tradition of work first started by Ori Hassan and, and since continued by many others, that movies actually evoke a lot of synchrony. So in other words, they make brains look the same. So if you and I are watching the same movie, um, our brains are gonna look really similar, not only in sensory regions, but interestingly also in many higher order regions. Um, and so we thought that something like movie watching could be a really interesting way to push, to test the limits of our identification framework. So can we still identify an individual? Can we still discriminate individuals from one another as they're all watching the same movie and experiencing this same rich uh, sensory and cognitive stimulation? And in order to test this, we were uh, we collaborated with Tammy Vanderwall, who was at Yale at the time, and she had a nice data set that we could use to test this. Um, smaller than HCP, but, but still uh, enough subjects to start to look at this. And so she had 34 healthy subjects that were scanned in a test retest design. Um, in each session, they had a resting state run and runs from two different movies. And um, the order, by the way, was, was counterbalanced across subjects. But these um, two movies are really interesting because they're so different. So this InScapes movie here, um, if you're familiar with this, this is kind of a cool, uh, I'm playing a clip from it here. So this was actually a movie that Tammy's lab designed. It was originally designed to promote compliance in, pe whoops, um, in pediatric uh, samples. So instead of just having them stare at a fixation cross, they kind of created this really abstract uh, movie of geometric shapes kind of moving around the screen. So um, it's very cool kind of visually, but there's no, um, you know, there's no clear semantic content, there's no, there's no humans or um, obviously recognizable objects. Uh, and they also used this clip from Ocean's Eleven, which is sort of a classic Hollywood style film where there's a lot of dialogue and action and um, much more sort of traditional movie style. Um, there was also audio associated with each of these clips, by the way, which I'm not playing for you here. So these were two very different movies that would allow us to test this um, question of whether we couldn't still do functional connectome based identification, even under these conditions where everyone's watching the same movie. Sorry, just before you go on there, Dr. Penn, there's a couple questions in the chat. 
Yeah. Um, so the first one uh, says, uh, I'm wondering how within person variability is accounted for when looking at individual differences. Uh, for example, what if person A is coming in in the morning and person B after a full day of work or a student coming in after their finals, et cetera? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and so we know that there's also a lot of within subject variability going on um, in our data. And I guess uh, the first way I would answer that would be, if anything, that should be working against us, right? So when we have the sort of test retest design, we know there's gonna be factors that are varying within a subject, but if we're still able to discriminate that subject from other subjects, it's telling us that even though that subject is probably varying around their mean, so to speak. So there, you know, there's some variation um there's some space in which that subject is varying sort of around um their sort of core mean it's not so much to make them overlap with somebody else right um the other thing to point out is that we're doing well well above chance but we're not doing perfectly in many cases so we do often um or sometimes you know fail to correctly identify a person and those failures of identification are also interesting um to, to look at. I won't really be able to go into that uh, here, but it, but it's it's a really good question. And I think there's definitely both things at play <laughs> and finding data sets that have careful, careful measurements on both sides. So both within subject uh, changes, as well as across subject, more stable differences uh, will really be key to kind of tease out those sources of variation. Okay, thanks. And there's uh, so there's a second question there as well. Uh, which is how young do you see the reliable fingerprints emerge? Are they stable in children or neonates? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's also a great question. And my uh, PhD lab, the the constable lab at Yale, is has started to expand a bit into developmental samples. Um, and I think that there is. I should just go back and look up these papers. I think that there is a lot of evidence that sort of by. Um, or like mid childhood at like the five to 10 sort of age range, you do start to see um, stabilization of the functional connectome. There's also been some really nice work showing that delayed stabilization is associated with uh, risk of psychopathology. Um, and then in infants, I believe the most current findings are that um, the connectome fingerprinting is a lot lower in infants. So it may not be like zero, there may still be some statistically significant identification there, but um, it's much more difficult in infants. So yeah, when ex exactly these signatures emerge in the course of development is also a really, really interesting question. Okay, awesome, thanks very much. Cool, thanks for the questions. Um, right, so basically what we found in this data set of Tammy's is that movie watching does in fact preserve individual identifiability. And what you're looking at here is a matrix, um, basically all possible pairs of scans. So. For example, when we try to match REST1 to REST2, uh, we get 91% accuracy in this data set. Um, and if we look down the diagonal here, these are identification rates between pairs of match scans. So REST1 to REST2, Inscapes1 to Inscapes2, and vice versa, et cetera. Um, and we can see that we're doing overall really well. So again, all of these are well above chance. Um, some of them, in, uh, in this case, this was actually numerically perfect. Um, and interestingly, uh, you know, again, this is just a, a numerical as opposed to a statistical comparison here, but we actually see that in this oceans condition, which is the one where we might expect the most similarity across brains, because it's kind of the most engaging and cognitively rich movie, um, we're actually getting up to 100% um, identification between these two scans. Uh, we also see uh, on the off diagonal, so matching between rest and either movie, we also see uh, strong identification rates there. So, um, this was a result that was encouraging to me as someone who was hoping to use these types of scan conditions to look more purposefully and more directly at individual differences. Um, so we're preserving and if anything, even enhancing the individual signal, even though we're making everybody look more similar at a sort of baseline level, um, whatever is allowing us to identify individuals on top of that group similarity is preserved or, or maybe even enhanced uh, in, in the movies, which was encouraging. Um, but as I said, uh, you know, in that first effort with the human connectome project data, we don't, we're, we're not necessarily interested in identification just for its own sake, right? Like if I want to know who someone is, I don't have to put them in an MRI scanner to figure that out. I can look at them, right? I can look at their actual fingerprints or their DNA. Um, so in my mind, and I think in the, in the mind of many others in the field, uh, you know, the real value in these uh, individual level profiles is in their ability to tell us something about present or future behavior. Uh, 
And so with that lens in mind, uh, at the same time that we were sort of starting to explore the uh, movie watching and naturalistic paradigms, we were also noticing this pretty convincing result that uh, if you're trying to do behavior prediction, you actually do much better when you're using data acquired during tasks as opposed to during rest. Uh, and these initial studies are all using traditional tasks um, because that's sort of what you know what we have available in these large scale data sets. But uh, these results here are from a, again a, a paper from my PhD lab showing that when um, so I, I mentioned on the HCP data that we were able to show significant prediction of fluid intelligence from resting state connectivity. But it turns out that for predicting that same behavior from the same subjects, you actually do much better if you calculate connectivity during a task and, and really any task. So um, this is sort of the same result shown on two different data sets. On the left, we have the Human Connectome Project. On the right, we have the Penn Neurodevelopmental Cohort, which is a, a data set of children and adolescents. Um, and essentially what we're looking at here is, is scan condition on the x-axis, so which data we're feeding into our model. Um, and on the y-axis is how much variance we can explain in a measure of fluid intelligence. And uh, in the HCP, you can see all the way out here on the right are the two rest scans. So they're actually doing the worst. I believe this model I don't think is significant. This model I think is still statistically significant, but it's not nearly as good as um, feeding the model data from one of these tasks. And these are, I think, gambling, working memory, emotion, so on and so forth. But even using a simple finger tapping task, that's what this motor task was, we're getting better predictions of fluid intelligence than we are from rest. And we see the same thing recapitulated broadly in the Penn neurodevelopmental data set where rest is doing the worst for predicting fluid intelligence. And if we give the model data from, for example, an emotion task or a working memory task, we're able to do uh, much better. Um, and this is, uh, has actually been replicated now by, by many groups and including on other data sets. So it's a pretty convincing result. Um, we're still sort of trying to tease out how much of this might be due to sort of basic data quality um, versus sort of more um, interesting in a way, uh, per, like perturbations of ongoing cognitive state. Um, but this was pretty convincing, I would say. Um, and so we wanted to take that same question and ask it of our movie watching naturalistic data. So traditional sorry, tasks do better than rest. Yeah, sorry. So just ahead. before you go on, because it was, it was right on that point, um, there's a question in the chat. Um, which is asking more or less exactly that. How does uh, fMRI acquisition, so like multiband or multi-echo or different kind of signal quality parameters uh, affect different affect the fingerprinting procedure? Yeah, it's another great question. Um, there was a paper that came out shortly after ours. I think it was in 2016. Um, the first author's last name is Aaron, A-I-R-A-N. Um, I can drop this reference um, somewhere if you'd like, but... Uh, basically asking like, do we need HCP quality data, for example, to, to see this result? And the answer seems to be no, it's actually pretty robust to um, different scan parameters and things like that. The one thing that does seem to matter in a lot of cases is amount of data per subject. Mm -hmm. um, although even though we, we do actually see significant identification going as low as like a minute or two of data, um, it does oh. get better the more data that you have. Um, and that also, I think, interestingly depends on task conditions. So tasks um, sort of may start to converge faster on the individual signature, so to speak, than rest. But that's, um, that's a result that may be sort of somewhat data set or, or task dependent. But the short answer is you don't need like super, super high quality data to see this result. Um, but things like head motion can disrupt this and other um, kind of subject level data quality issues can certainly have an effect. But in terms of your imaging parameters, it's actually pretty robust as far as we can tell. Okay. Awesome, thanks a lot. Sure. Um, okay, so traditional tasks do better than rest for behavior prediction, what about movies? Uh, to answer this, we turned to a different part of the Human Connectome Project. This time there's 70 data set that actually does include movie watching. Um, so this is a data set, it's a, a smaller data set than the 3T data set. There's 176 healthy young adults in this data set. Um, and we were sort of broadly interested in predicting behavior across uh, a few different domains. And because this data set comes with um, a pretty large battery of phenotypic measures, uh, and we didn't have strong hypotheses about which ones might be better predicted, we decided to boil these down into sort of two 
large domains, one cognitive and one kind of socioaffective emotional. Um, and so we did a PCA on uh, scores in each of these domains as defined by HCP to essentially extract one target, the first principal component of each of these domains. So one cognitive score per subject, one socioaffective score per subject. And those were the target behaviors that we were trying to predict. And our main question or our main um, goal in the study was to sort of pit resting state connectivity against movie watching connectivity to predict behaviors in these two domains. And just to give you a sense for the way this arm of the data set was structured, there were also two different days of scanning um, and multiple sessions on each day. We were interested in the sessions that included both rest and a movie watching run. And the way those sessions were structured was there was an initial resting state run that was 15 minutes. And then there were two different movie runs that were each 15 minutes long. And importantly, um, even though these are called movie one, two, three, and four, they're actually comprised of a series of individual video clips. So it's not one continuous movie. Um, it's depending on the run, like four to five clips that are maybe two to three minutes each. And those are separated by a 20 second period of rest. Um, so when we tried training our model on functional connectivity acquired during rest and movies to see how well we could predict behavior, uh, what we see here, what I'm showing you here first is the predictions of cognitive ability. And so um, on the x-axis here is the, uh, the run that's going into the model. In dark gray are, is the resting state and purple are the movie runs. Um, in this study, we did 100 iterations of the model just to um, try it across different train test splits to see, uh, to get a distribution of, of model performance. Um, and in, in all cases, we compared that to a null distribution that's shown in light gray, which we generated by just shuffling um, participant labels with respect to the behavioral scores. Um, so, right, so what you're seeing here on the x-axis is run, and that's plotted against a distribution of model accuracy, essentially, so the correlation between predicted and observed scores. And what you can start to see is that um, in session one, even though we're getting significant prediction of cognitive ability from rest, we're actually doing better uh, when we use the movie watching data. Uh, and specifically, this movie two run seems to, seems to do really, really well, and I'll come back to that. Um, by session two, which was actually session four <laughs> over the course of two days of scanning, the data quality was overall a bit worse. Um, so we're actually not able to generate a significant prediction from rest, but we are still able to significantly predict cognitive ability from the movie watching data. Um, when we look at our socioaffective domain, this is a domain that's harder to predict overall, and that's something that's been noted by um, other studies as well. One important thing to point out is that all of the measures that went into this score were self-report, whereas the me measures that went into the cognitive ability were behavior-based. Um, but to the extent that we can get any significant prediction of this score, it's coming only from um, movie one in this first session. And I believe none of the session two runs gave us a significant prediction of this score. So this is some preliminary evidence that um, movie watching does in fact do better than rest for behavior prediction. And diving into this a bit more, so I told you that each of these runs is comprised of several different clips. And so we then wanted to ask the question of, are there certain clips that do better for prediction than others? Um, and this is kind of getting at the question of how much does the actual content of the movie matter for our prediction accuracy? Uh, and so what you're seeing here is the individual movies split into their respective clips. You may um, recognize some of these movie names. So some of them came from well-known Hollywood movies like Inception, The Social Network, Coincidentally, also Ocean's Eleven, and we had things like Home Alone, Aaron Brockovich, and Star Wars. Uh, the ones in movie one and movie three were sort of more independent um, clips found on Vimeo, documentary style things. Uh, and basically the, the point, the takeaway point here is that we do see a lot of variation actually in how these clips are performing for behavior prediction. And remember, it's the exact same subjects and the exact same behavior we're trying to predict. And just depending on the content of the movie, um, we see these significant differences in prediction accuracy. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this as well. Uh, so this is those results for the cognitive score. We also tried this for emotion, which again is harder, harder to predict across the board, but to the extent that we are getting any prediction of the sort of socio-affective emotional tendencies, it was coming from um, a few uh, specific clips. So just before you go on, there's one more question in, or two more questions in the chat now. Um, there's one question asking what kind of training, testing, split, and validation method was used for, for all of these findings that you're just showing. 
Yeah, so we used a tenfold cross validation. There's no internal um, validation within the training set, but it's basically a, a 90 10 split where we learn the model on 90% of subjects and then test it on uh, the held out 10%. Okay, uh, cool. And there's 100 iterations that go into each of these. Uh, so 100 different um, random trained test splits, uh, also respecting family structure because there are right. a lot of twins and siblings in this data set. Yeah. Right. So never splitting families across folds. Okay. Um, yeah. So then there's another question, uh, which is asking if you think that familiarity with the movie might be explaining some of this uh, variation. Yeah, there. it's a great question. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, in this data set, the participants were not asked if they had seen the movies before. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, uh, you would think that healthy young adults were probably likely to have seen many of these movies. Um, I think it's a really interesting question in the sense of like, you know, you could imagine that if I've seen the social network and then I see this particular three minute clip, I'm able to situate that clip into the larger narrative in a way that would probably change the experience for me versus someone that's mm -hmm. never seen the film before. Um, of course, that's also potentially confounded with just the fact that these are kind of Hollywood style, heavily produced, you know, designed to grab our attention in certain ways. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, we were not able to control for that at all because the HCP didn't collect that data, but it's definitely um, something that we think about a lot. And I think uh, future studies should absolutely um, ask about that so that we could potentially look at those effects. Right. There's also a couple of comments kind of uh, coming in on, on that same point um, about the type of content. For example, social network has a lot of dialogue um, or emotional effective content might be really important as well. And if you have any thoughts on those or... Yeah, that's a great preview yeah. for where I'm going next. <laughs> so okay, great. We, uh, we also noticed that uh, the movies or the clips, at least that we're doing the best, tended to be very high in social content. And so we quantified that in sort of a simple way by just looking at um, the number, the percentage of TRs in that clip that contained at least one face on the screen. So that was kind of our proxy for social content. And then we correlated that with the median prediction accuracy across those models that we ran. And we did see a fairly convincing relationship such that the clips that were higher in social content also did better for prediction. And just to kind of give you a flavor, um, as you can probably imagine, you know, the clips from Social Network, Ocean's Eleven and Inception all involved, yeah, a lot of dialogue, fast paced, many actors on the screen at once. Uh, the clips that did the worst <laughs> were sort of these ones from uh, these more like montage style documentary nature kind of things um, with very few humans on screen. So yeah, um, this is definitely suggestive. Uh, you know, I would say there's a lot of other things that we might want to try to control for. And these clips were not necessarily uh, selected in a systematic way to try to orthogonalize all of the various features that might be explaining this effect. But it's certainly um, a fairly convincing hint that, yeah, social content uh, is doing the best. The one thing that we did uh, that we were sort of able to get at here, you know, one question with this result was, well, is it truly the social content itself or is it just that the social clips are more engaging and they're more arousing um, and they're kind of synchronizing people on that basic arousal level um, more so than the other clips. And one way that we sort of thought we might be able to get at that was um, that the HCP did release eye tracking data. They did co collect simultaneous eye tracking data with the fMRI. Um, not all of it is usable, but some of it was usable. And we, we sort of hypothesized that um, gaze trajectory might be a good proxy for the similarity of engagement across people. So if a clip is really sort of synchronizing people's attention um, and arousal processes, then it might be the case that we're all sort of looking in the same place at the screen at the same time. Uh, and so in order to quantify that, we calculated this sort of eye tracking intersubject correlation measure. Uh, so for every pair of subjects, we calculated how synchronized their eye movements were during a clip. And we hypothesized that if uh, sort of general engagement were explaining those prediction results, we might see that clips that more strongly synchronized people across the data set in terms of their eye gaze uh, might also do better for prediction. So we took the median eye tracking ISC value here from this matrix. So sort of in general, how similar are subjects eye movements um, and how does that relate to prediction accuracy from that clip? And we actually found no relationship here. <laughs> so it was not the case that clips that sort of broadly synchronized eye movements also did better for prediction. However, interestingly, there was a relationship between standard deviation 
and prediction accuracy. And what this was telling us is that basically um, clips where some pairs of subjects are strongly synchronized in their eye movements, but other pairs of subjects are not. Um, so the sort of variability across subject pairs, that was what related positively to the prediction accuracy. Uh, and one way to interpret this would be that it's not sort of a general engagement arousal signal, it's more that the clips are engaging different people in different ways. Um, and that's what tended to relate to better prediction accuracy for this cognitive variable. Um, the, that, that may actually answer some of these, these questions in the chat, but there, there were two more questions that I just thought to read out uh, in case you have any other comments on them. But um, the first question was uh, whether you could comment on the cognition that was being captured by the correlation between movement watching and cognitive ability. Uh, do you think this correlation could be explained by differences in attention? Uh, you're sort of talking about this there, but I don't know. If you yeah, I mean, this was kind there. of the best way that we knew to, to, to get at that, but there's certainly many other ways that we could try to, to quantify that and look at that relationship. Yeah. And then, then, yeah, the second question was related to the above. Was there any attempt to gauge subject interest in, any, in each of the movie genres? Could this impact attention and engagement? And again, probably a similar thing that you're doing here, but if you have any yeah. Um, again, I guess, yeah, so, you know, for future data sets, it would be great if there were some sort of debrief questionnaire um, that subjects filled out about, you know, like how generally engaging or arousing they found each clip. We didn't have access to that here. Um, right. But uh, yeah, it's certainly something that could be contributing. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, just a quick time check. Okay. <laughs> the first section was by far the longest, I promise, but I'll try to speed up. So can we detect stable and meaningful individual differences during naturalistic simulation? I'm going to say yes, in the sense of the, the stable part is that identifiability or quote unquote fingerprinting is preserved during movie watching. Um, but also for the meaningful part, movie watching outperforms rest for predicting behavior. Um, so moving into this second part. Can we design a bespoke naturalistic stimulus to draw out variation on a certain trait of interest? So, so far we've sort of been playing around in exploratory ways with existing large scale data sets, but can we actually uh, design a targeted task paradigm that uh, we could use to pull out a specific, a specific um, trait variation? And so the trait we went after first was paranoia. Um, so paranoia is an interesting one because uh, we know in its extreme, it's associated with clinical uh, psychotic conditions like schizophrenia. Uh, however, it also varies on a spectrum, even in the healthy population. And so what we did briefly in the study was we wrote an original fictional narrative to serve as a stimulus for this study. And you're looking at the picture of a jungle because the story was about an American physician that goes down to um, the rural Amazon jungle and starts to treat patients there. And uh, this was all pre-COVID, by the way, but it's like a little funny thinking back now. Um, the, the story is sort of designed such that like, at some points, it feels like she was kind of lured there under false pretenses. There's this weird disease that crops up that no one knows what it is. At other times, her interactions with the villagers are more are neutral or even positive. And the story kind of leaves off at a cliffhanger. And the idea is that different people will hear this story and depending on their kind of baseline level of trade paranoia, they might arrive at different interpretations of the story. Um, and so, right, so we scanned people on this paradigm. We also had uh, several trait level measures, including trade paranoia that we acquired on them. And moving away a little bit from the functional connectivity world, I think one of the most exciting things about naturalistic stimuli is that they open the door to this analysis technique called intersubject correlation. And um, many people might be familiar with this, but this is the very elegant idea that if two brains are exposed to the same sort of rich temporally varying stimulus over time, if we see a correlation in the activity time course of the same region across two different brains, we can infer that that region is somehow responding to the stimulus. Um, again, this is a uh, pioneering work by Uri Hassan and many others in that tradition. Uh, in this study, we were interested not necessarily in what's common to everybody, but which regions might be more synchronized in certain pairs of participants than others, uh, and whether this might relate to people's trade paranoia. So in other words, if you and I come at this story with a similar level of baseline paranoia, we might also get a more similar interpretation of the story, and that might be reflected in more similar patterns of brain activity. So uh, before I show you the uh, ISC results stratified by trade paranoia, I'll just briefly show you ISC across the whole sample. So these are regions that are strongly correlated across different individuals as they hear this exact same story. 
And happily, you can see that some of the areas of highest synchrony are in primary auditory cortex. This was an audio delivered story, so that was good to see. Um, my favorite thing about this map is that if you look at some of the peaks of cross subject synchrony outside of A1, you see things like the temporoparietal junction or posterior STS. If you do a um, neurosynth or meta-analysis uh, search for this particular voxel, you get things like theory of mind and mentalizing. Same thing for this peak down here in the cerebellum. So this is a, a bit of reverse inference, but it's um, some hint that uh, our story is provoking the types of cognitive processes and, and specifically social cognitive processes that we hoped it might. Um, but again, this is intersubject correlation or ISC across all of the participants. And what we're most interested in is where does ISC vary according to people's baseline trait paranoia. Uh, so to look at that, we split our subjects into a high group and a low group in terms of their trait paranoia score, which again was independent from the story itself. It was a baseline questionnaire, essentially um, a self-report questionnaire about paranoid tendencies in daily life. And what we see when we stratify the sample in this way is we see four regions emerge as uh, more strongly synchronized during this story in the high paranoia group as compared to the low paranoia group. So I'm showing you the name of the region as well as the top neurosynth results uh, for that region. Um, and we thought that this was kind of interesting because again, everyone's getting the exact same sensory simulation in the form of this story. Uh, but we see these more stereotyped responses in people that have a higher baseline trait paranoia in certain areas as compared to the low group. And I should say we also did some pretty careful controls to rule out just sort of general attention effects. We had a, a memory test at the end. There was no difference in group performance on that. There was no difference in age or sex or other demographic variables. Uh, there was no difference in general um, IQ or verbal IQ. Uh, so it seemed like this effect was at least somewhat specific to this paranoia variable. And the fun thing about naturalistic tasks like stories is that we can use data-driven methods like intersubject correlation to figure out where the differences are, but then we can also go back to the stimulus itself and ask what might be driving activity in these regions in some pairs of participants, but not others. Um, I'm going to skip this for now just for reasons of time, um, but essentially because we had created this stimulus, we, uh, we had sort of inserted events that we hypothesized would arouse more suspicion um, in the people with higher trait paranoia compared to low. So what we did is we had a, a group of independent raters go through and mark events where they uh, thought that the main character was experiencing an ambiguous social interaction or explicitly mentalizing, in other words, thinking about the intentions of other characters. And we were able to create uh, a sort of classic regressor style um, GLM analysis using this time course. And um, these are just two examples of a socially ambiguous or mentalizing sentence as compared to a non-mentalizing sentence. Uh, but essentially we hypothesized that maybe some of that increased stereotyped activity in the high paranoia group would be in response to these particular events in the story. And we tested that in an ROI-based analysis. So we had our two ROIs that, uh, if you recall from a few slides ago, were more synchronized in the high paranoia group and also uh, previously known to be involved in social cognition. So we hypothesized that these ROIs would be uh, more responsive to these events in the high paranoia group. We also had a positive control region here in sort of the TPJ or PSTS. If you recall from the very first ISC slide, this was a region that was highly synchronized in everybody, but didn't show a group difference. So we thought that this region should respond to these events um, across the population, but not necessarily more so in high paranoia participants. We also had a negative control here in primary auditory cortex that shouldn't be particularly, particularly responsive to the, these events in either group. Um, and to just sort of breeze through this, that's basically exactly what we found. So we found, oops, uh, we found that for are two social cognition regions that were more synchronized in the high paranoia group. These regions showed a stronger response to these events um, as compared to the low group. Whereas in the left PSTS, we see a strong response to these events across both groups, but no group difference. Um, and finally, in primary auditory, we don't see a, a, a enhanced response to these events in either group and there's no group difference. So uh, this is just, in our minds, kind of an interesting demonstration of how you can use naturalistic stimuli to actually go back and see what types of material in the actual stimulus could have been driving the differences across individuals that we're seeing.
Um, sorry, just before you go on, I know time is time is short, but there's a couple couple more questions in the chat. Um, one is asking if you checked for overall differences or differences in overall emotionality or something kind of more broad than paranoia on, on the emotion side. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we had sort of a general like personality battery. It wasn't the full big five. It was something sort of approximating that. And um, we didn't see any obvious differences with any of those traits that we were able to pull out from there. Um, but yeah, there's certainly other types of traits that could potentially co-vary with paranoia. And we didn't, you know, we got sort of as much as we could, but we, you know, we didn't fully sample all of the the possible traits there. So yeah, um, it's it's certainly possible that uh, other factors like that are at play. Okay, all right, great, thanks. Cool, um, okay, so I'm also gonna skip this for reasons of time, but we did sort of a cool free recall task uh, to also be able to show that people's behavioral reactions to the story uh, differ as a function of trade paranoia. And we can come back to that if people are interested. Um, but to sum up this second section, uh, in, in this kind of initial proof of concept study, we're seeing that an ambiguous social narrative can evoke differences along this axis of paranoia. So this is an interesting example of using naturalistic stimuli specifically to draw out uh, these, these differences that we might be interested in. I'm, Emily, just uh, feel free. To, I, know, I know time is tight, but feel free to take your time. I mean, we're asking a lot of questions and people are clearly engaged. So I think we'd, we'd love to see as much of the content as you're as you're able to, to show us, provided you're not too tight on time as well. So, <laughs> no, okay. I, I can I can stick around. Um, right, cool, yeah. I'll just, uh, this last section is is a bit shorter, but it's sort of, I think is interesting and, and worth talking about. So um, yeah, the, the questions are great. So feel free to continue to stop me. Um, uh, yeah, so um, one thing I kind of glossed over in the paranoia study is that I sort of broke my own rule in the sense that paranoia is a continuous variable, at least in the way that we measured it. Um, and the way that we created those groups was basically based on a median split. Um, and that was not satisfying to me. And so I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years thinking about the best way to model individual variability um, in naturalistic contexts. And there's some uh, sort of, I think, kind of nuanced, but also interesting uh, issues that come up when we think about this. And so um, I'm trying to sort of advance this framework that I've been calling idiosynchrony. So how do we adapt methods that were originally designed to pull out shared group responses during naturalistic simulation? So things like intersubject correlation um, that were, again, initially designed to pull out what's common across people. How do we adapt those to study um, what's different across people? And Sam Nastase uh, and, and the Hassan group had a nice paper a couple of years ago, uh, kind of a, a review of ISC methods. And they have this nice formulation here that helps us sort of decompose the components of a voxel time course as uh, people are exposed to a naturalistic stimulus into these different uh, components. So the way that these authors formalize this is that essentially the response in a given voxel, so that's X, um, in a given subject, which is denoted by I at time T, is basically a function of these three different components. There's this shared stimulus evoked response, this C of T. Um, and that's again, a, a, the part of the time course that's kind of common to everybody. So it's driven by the stimulus and it's shared across people. So there's no sort of subject level subscript here, as you'll know, it's just C of T. There's a sort of a stereotype time course um, for that voxel at that time. Um, the other thing that goes into the individual voxel signal uh, is this idiosyncratic stimulus evoked response. So this is um, the component of the signal that is we're still responding to the stimulus, but it's unique to that subject. So it's sort of our idiosyncratic level um, brain response to, to whatever we're watching or experiencing on the screen. The third component is sort of the stimulus unrelated activity. So this could be you know, noise in the sense of scanner noise or other artifacts in our signal. It could also be neuronal activity that's just not related to the stimulus. So sort of mind wandering and just ongoing processes that are not stimulus driven. Uh, and so the traditional formulation of ISC, basically we're able to recover this C of T, but we're not able to recover either of these um, because these are unique to individual subjects. Um, and of course, you know, this is this component here is the one that I'm most interested in. So how do we uh, sort of formulate this in a way that would potentially allow us to recover uh, this idiosyncratic component. 
Um, and really the main challenge here is to separate that from the stimulus unrelated activity. So one sort of, I guess I should acknowledge one sort of obvious way to do this would be to show a subject the same stimulus twice or, or more times, and then we could potentially start to isolate that. There's been some interesting work looking at that, um, especially actually in, in populations with autism. Um, but one problem with that that may already be occurring to you is that, you know, watching the same movie twice may not be the same experience, um, especially if it's a sort of rich movie that has twists and turns. And, you know, when we watch things a second time, uh, we have anticipation effects, we have memory effects, we may be more engaged at certain times, we may be less engaged at certain times. Um, so while that's a potentially fruitful way to start to get at this, it also comes with its own issues. So another way to try to get at this idiosyncratic component is, to by, is by anchoring it to something else that we know about each subject like behavior. So for example, um, and sort of continuing the analogy from the paranoia study, uh, the sort of intuition here would be that if there is a stereotyped response to a stimulus associated with a certain trait, like trait paranoia, the degree to which a given subject expresses that stereotyped response is related to um, their trait paranoia in this case, right? So you can kind of think this, think of this like a multiplier on this sort of latent response that we might be able to discover um, if we had access to uh, this behavioral measure on our subjects that are experiencing the stimulus. Um, so this is kind of the, the framework that I started to think about this in. And the theory behind this, or I, I guess the first of all, the problem statement for this is how do we relate behavior where we're getting one measure per subject to ISC where we're getting one measure per subject pair. There's sort of a fundamental tension here, right? I can't calculate inter-subject correlation with just myself. I always have to be comparing myself to another subject. Um, and that's sort of the strength of ISC in the sense that uh, it kind of allows the data to tell us what's most important. So we don't necessarily have to model specific features of the stimulus. We can use one person's brain response as a model for another person's brain response. Um, and that allows us to kind of recover in this data-driven way the maximal signal associated with the stimulus. However, it does uh, introduce this tension when we're then trying to relate uh, things that we observe with ISC to uh, things like behavior, which operate on the level of the subject as opposed to the subject pair. Um, so one framework that we can think about this uh, in would be something like a representational similarity analysis, uh, or in this case, what I and many others have called intersubject representational similarity analysis. And the idea here is that if we take uh, an ISC matrix from a given brain region. So, you know, let's say this is our uh, TBJ as people are listening to the paranoia story or, you know, any other region, any other stimulus. If we have a subject by subject matrix telling us how similar each pair of subjects brain response is, we could potentially relate that to a matrix telling us how similar uh, each pair of subject is on some behavioral measure. And this is, you know, a sort of basic representational similarity analysis framework, it seems quite straightforward. Um, we would then, you know, compare the upper triangle of these matrices to see if the brain similarity structure matches the behavioral similarity structure. And if so, you know, we might say that whatever trait we're looking at here has an influence on brain responses here. Um, seems great, except that there's actually uh, a fair amount of nuance in how we calculate behavioral similarity across people. Um, so how do we actually calculate this matrix? One obvious thing that might occur to us is to just use Euclidean distance. So, you know, if I score four and you score seven, then the difference or the similarity, depending on how you look at it, is three, right? So these are, you can think of these as dissimilarity matrices as well. Um, and that's probably, you know, the most common way that people might go about constructing these matrices. But it turns out that by using things like Euclidean distance, you're actually baking in a pretty big assumption uh, into your analysis. And I'll try to sort of walk you through in qualitative terms what I mean by that. So by formalizing the behavioral distance between people as just the difference between two scores, um, and you can think of these like two scalars, like age or performance on a cognitive task or anything where we're just sort of getting one number per subject. Uh, if we construct our distance matrix, just looking at the difference between those two scores, we are inherently assuming that the structure of the brain data should look something like this. And this is uh, simulated data. I wish the real data looked this pretty, <laughs> just to uh, note that up front. But basically, this is a toy matrix showing that if we were to order, this is a subjects by subjects matrix. So if we were to order subjects from low to high, for example, on some behavioral score, 
uh, this is what we would predict the brain's the similarity matrix would look like. So you can see strong similarity along the diagonal and uh, less similarity sort of in the off diagonal. And basically what this means is that people who score similarly to one another on this scale should look similar in their brain response, regardless of whether they score high or low. So for example, um, if I score a zero and you score a one, uh, we should look just as similar as a pair of subjects where uh, one subject scores 99 and the other subject scores 100, even though we're at totally opposite ends of the scale. That is what this formulation of the model is assuming. And so we call this, uh, and this would be a sort of two-dimensional embedding of what this distance matrix would look like. So we have sort of this clear linear axis from low scores to high scores, um, but it's all about the relative distance from another subject, as opposed to where you fall in an absolute sense on the scale. Um, however, uh, this might not be the case. In fact, it's often not the case. <laughs> so another potential uh, structure that the data could take could be something like this. So, and this is sort of what we were seeing in the paranoia data, for example. So in this case, um, we might actually see that all of the high scores, for example, have a strong stereotyped response, whereas the low scores are just more variable. So they're less similar to other low scores as well as to the high scores. And so here in this 2D production, you can kind of see just that. So there's this sort of the high scores are all kind of clumping together. And then there's this spreading of variance when it comes to the, the low scores. Um, and this structure would not be well captured by something like a Euclidean distance. In this case, this structure is captured by taking the mean score of your two participants in constructing the behavioral similarity matrix. Um, and there's a couple of other ways that you can um, construct these, these distance matrices that all kind of um, predict a, a similar structure to the data. In this case, this one's kind of interesting. So this is, um, in this case, you might have a situation where the high scores are all tightly clustered, and then the low scores are kind of spreading out, but not in any random direction, in sort of a consistent direction, but there's still just much more variability among the low scores than the high scores. Um, and of course, depending on the measure you're using, this could be flipped such that the low scores are similar and, and vice versa. But this is sort of the intuition for why the distance model that you use could actually really impact the results that you're seeing. Because by using this matrix, you're only going to be able to, sorry, by using this matrix in your RSA, you're only going to be able to recover relationships that look like this. Um, whereas in fact, there may be many traits or scores uh, that follow more of, of this type of model. And so we've been calling this model the nearest neighbors model because it just predicts that you're most similar to your neighbors on the scale, regardless of whether you're a high or low scorer. Uh, whereas this models, we, these models we call the Anna Karenina models after the famous opening line of that novel, which I believe goes, all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way or, or something to that effect. So um, in this case, uh, this would be showing us that all high scores are alike, whereas all low scores are low scoring in their own way. Um, and just to sort of show you that this actually matters. Uh, so in the paranoia data, we actually saw much more of an Anna Karenina effect than we did a, a nearest neighbor effect. Um, that we, you know, were recovered by doing this sort of median split approach, but then we sort of rediscovered using this, um, I think, more correct uh, continuous way of doing things. Uh, there's also been uh, recent sort of interesting reports of this and a credit effects in the wild. Um, this is, again, the paranoia data set shown in a continuous way. So this is that left temporal pole region. Um, and this is real data now. So these are our subjects ordered by their trait paranoia scores. Um, and this is the ISC matrix for this region. And you can kind of see that as we move down into the right, um, you see more synchrony among these pairs of high uh, scoring participants and just less synchrony overall uh, in low scores, both to other low scores and to the high scores. Uh, Carolyn Parkinson and Alyssa Bayek at UCLA uh, have a really interesting uh, preprint out now showing that more popular individuals have more similar neural responses during movie watching, uh, while less uh, popular individuals are more idiosyncratic. So they actually quantified this using uh, a dorm-based sample at UCLA uh, and showed people movies in the scanner and, and found um, this effect uh, in several different brain regions. So it's kind of interesting. And then there's also been some reports of this type of thing in clinical populations. So this was a nice paper came out last year showing that uh, the typicality of, um, sorry, whoops, um, just start with this. So this was a data set with healthy controls and patients with schizophrenia watching movies. And you can kind of see um, 
this nice stereotyped response in blue that's shared among all of the healthy controls. Um, and then the patients with schizophrenia, there's just more variability here. And when they did a two-dimensional projection of this, they actually saw this uh, structure here that kind of recapitulates what I was showing you with the toy data on the previous slide. So all of the healthy controls in blue here are kind of clustered together uh, in one part of the space. And the patients with schizophrenia are kind of spreading out into this other aspect of the space and just have much more variance overall. And they were actually able to classify just based on these time courses, whether uh, a subject was a control or a patient with schizophrenia. Um, so that's my modeling method soapbox, <laughs> but these things actually really matter a lot. And I think thinking about these effects is interesting. And, and, and just to be clear, um, you know, there definitely might be nearest neighbors effects in some brain regions in some populations, um, but sort of testing lots of these different models to try to parse out what the structure of the data is uh, for a given population and a given trait under study in a given stimulus and a given brain region, <laughs> you know, there could be uh, differences in how well these models are doing. Um, and, and that could be uh, really interesting and informative. Um, okay. Uh, any questions on that section I, before I start to wrap up? Or maybe I lost people with distance matrices. That's okay. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't see any in the chat and I don't see any hands. So I think you can go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so how should we model individual variability during naturalistic stimulation? Um, I think uh, intersubject representational similarity analysis is a promising framework, but uh, the distance model that we use really matters um, and actually gives us an opportunity to test lots of models to, to try to parse out uh, this variance um, in a somewhat data-driven way. Um, okay, I'm actually gonna, well, okay, I'll talk about this briefly. So one thing I think about a lot, I don't have an answer to this, but um, a lot of times I get asked uh, like, you know, if I want to run a naturalistic imaging study, how do I choose a stimulus? <laughs> and so uh, this is a huge question that I'm not, probably not the best person to try to answer. But one thing I think about a lot in the context of individual differences is basically how much ISC is optimal, right? So um, I think movie watching is giving us a handle on these things because it's introducing a sort of shared experience that we're kind of, I think of it as like sort of a lens that we project people through, right? By constraining the activity in some way um, as compared to rest, which is totally unconstrained by sort of projecting people through this lens of the same movie experience, um, it allows us to see interesting differences start to emerge. So even though the variability is overall constrained, the variability that remains might be more meaningful and more interesting. Uh, but then that brings up this interesting question of, well, how much do we want to constrain the system, right? Like how much intersubject correlation is optimal when we're trying to choose a stimulus specifically for an individual differences experiment? Um, and these are just sort of like theoretical curves that we might think about. So if we think about plotting how much synchrony a stimulus evokes against some something about its sensitivity to individual differences, so I don't know, maybe this is prediction accuracy for behavior models or, or something else, um, you know, it could be that just pushing people a little bit into some shared space, um, you know, really leaves the most room for those individual differences to still be there. Um, you know, this curve could be sort of pushed out a little bit to the right, such that, no, we actually do want a little bit more of a meaty stimulus that's kind of um, synchronizing people a little bit more. And then, you know, in, in, the, in the absolute limit, right, where we have a stimulus that is everybody is perfectly synchronized, there's no going to be no more individual variability to look at, right? So, um, but then of course, we also know that uh, at the other limit, which could be something like resting state, we're not going to be as sensitive, at least, you know, based on the evidence so far uh, to individual differences. So sort of figuring out where we should be um, in this space is something that's um, really interesting. Like you could think about if you wanted to study fear or like trait anxiety, if you show everybody a horror movie, you know, on the one hand, that's evoking the processes that you're interested in, in a way that might be useful. On the other hand, um, if it's a really scary movie, you might be making subjects who are generally not super fearful or anxious look fearful or anxious just because, you know, they're watching a horror movie. So sort of finding that Goldilocks sweet spot of, you know, what should our stimulus be? And of course, it's probably going to vary by, um, the behaviors that we're interested in, the processes that we're trying to study, but that's sort of an open question that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, just to briefly preview our next steps, one of the things we're doing in the lab now is we're working with a data set of four um, sort of indie films <laughs> that are 
Three of them have social content. One of them is this Rube Goldberg machine that is sort of a mechanical trajectory, but not a social one. Um, so sort of trying to follow up on the social content findings and test this in a more explicit way to see which film best pulls out differences uh, specifically related to symptoms of mood disorders. Uh, and also trying to figure out where along the processing hierarchy we see these differences. So the nice thing about naturalistic stimuli is you kind of get all of these features for free. You have low level features, uh, audiovisual stuff like loudness, frequency, um, luminance and flow, but then you're also getting at the same time, you know, sort of mid-level semantic categories like the presence of faces or scenes on the screen. Uh, and then you also think have things sort of at the higher end of the cognitive hierarchy, like language and emotional tone. So one thing we might predict would be that, um, you know, we might see that this is again toy data. But we might see that individuals are sort of more similar in their responses to the lower level features. But as you move up into these higher level features, you start to see more divergence across people. So that's one thing that we're currently looking at and hope to have results to share at some point. Um, so I'm a bit over time. With that, I will conclude and uh, thank collaborators at NIMH and Yale, as well as my current lab here at Dartmouth, uh, funding sources, and leave you with this final visual picture of the dangers of averaging data across subjects. Um, and thank you for your time and attention and the great questions. And I'm happy to, to take any more questions if people have time. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hannah. That was a really interesting talk. I think everybody was very engaged and, and uh, interested to hear what you had to say. Uh, there's one question in the chat. I think we'll do maybe about two questions here, but then there is a student discussion afterwards. I think, uh, yeah, so if, if people have more kind of involved things, uh, they can stick around a little bit and, and ask those afterwards. But there's one question in the chat right now, uh, which is asking, are you always using the same algorithm throughout your fingerprinting studies? And how much do you think the prediction results depend on the algorithm choice itself? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I've, in my hands, I've always sort of used our most basic formulation of the fingerprinting album, uh, algorithm, which is literally just to compute the correlation between a, a connectivity matrix um, from a given subject with every other subject, um, and then choose the subject that has the highest correlation. So just sort of an argmax kind of approach. Um, there's been some really cool extensions to that framework, um, mostly by other groups uh, that I can certainly forward some, some good references for um, that actually more explicitly quantify. So basically a failure of identification doesn't tell you much about the sort of absolute similarity of a subject to him or herself. Like for example, if I'm correlated with myself at 0.1, <laughs> that's pretty low, but if I'm correlated with everybody else at 0.09 or lower, I'm still gonna correctly identify myself, right? Whereas like, if I'm correlated with myself at 0.7, but I'm correlated with somebody else at 0.72, you know, that's gonna be an identification failure, but it's not necessarily telling us that I'm not similar to myself. It's just that, you know, so um, there's definitely more nuanced ways of doing the fingerprinting that could give you even more information about sort of that uh, relative ratio of within to between subject variability. Um, and there's also been some interesting statistical extensions to the framework looking at sort of what should be our null distribution for this? You know, how should like, how much identification can we expect due to chance and things like that? Um, so others have kind of taken that and extended it in more sophisticated ways. Um, but yeah, I still think sort of the, the basic fingerprinting of just who am I most correlated to? That's my guess for who I am. Um, that kind of, it's, it's, it's still, I think, a useful proxy for the overall ratio of kind of within to between subject variability. Um, right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, are there any other, any other questions before we wrap up the kind of main, main talk? There is, there is that discussion afterwards if there are more kind of, oh yeah, there's a question from Millar. Great, great talk, Emily. Thanks so much for, for taking the time. Um, I have a, Hopefully, a quick question. So, um, you know, you've shown really elegantly that, that the fingerprints are are really trait markers. They're not really too dependent on state necessarily, um, at least with the data that that you have. I was, I was wondering, did you because you used HCP data? Has anyone have you or has anyone else ever looked at the heritability of those fingerprints? And so, and especially with the stuff that you showed at the end, um, kind of being able to compare at some level. Uh, I guess the connectivity between individuals as well. Is there some way to kind of package all that and, and look at heritability uh, if it hasn't already been done? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I, I didn't really highlight, I sometimes say this on that slide, I didn't today, but yeah, like I think one of the most interesting things about that like initial result that we found from 2015 is that we were only working with 126 subjects at the time, but there were actually 50 sets of twins in that initial sample because the HCP is weighted towards twins and siblings. And so actually 100 of the 126 people in that data set had a twin in the same data set, which like in theory should make our problem even harder, right? Because that's the person in the world that you should be most similar to. And initially we, we absolutely expected that like to the extent that we had failures of identification, we might be more likely to mistake uh, someone for their twin. Um, when we actually tried to quantify that as part of that initial 2015 study, we actually didn't see that effect, <laughs> which was sort of surprising. Um, but I think in some ways, uh, especially with the, the rest scans in that data set, which were actually also the longest scans. So we didn't do a great job of controlling for scan duration. It turns out that if you do control for scan duration, the advantage for rest largely goes away. But long story short, in that initial sample, in our hands, we didn't actually find that we were more likely to mistake subjects for their twin. Um, and so we didn't really like go into that in the paper at all. That being said, I don't think that that means that these things are not heritable. I think there's there's actually been um, some really nice work from other groups specifically looking at heritability of resting state connectivity. I think um, there's been, a, I wanna say it's the, there's a paper by um, Maxwell Elliott is the first author. They're kind of looking at general, what they call general functional connectivity. So, um, combining connectivity from rest and different task states and they do in the HTTP data itself. And they do find um, that a lot of the connectivity profile is heritable in some way when they sort of specifically look at it in that framework. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure why that didn't come out in our initial set of results, but I think now with the full data set and being well powered to look at that, um, there's definitely some evidence of heritability there. And that's another, you know, really interesting, like the genetics is another really interesting aspect to, to try to bring in. And I haven't started going down that road yet, but um, yeah, it's super interesting. Great, thanks so much. All right, I think that that about wraps up uh, the time for questions. So thanks everybody for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Finn, for, for the talk. It was really interesting and illuminating, I think for everybody. Um, and yeah, as a reminder, if there's any more involved kind of questions, I think uh, if you want to stick around uh, I think a little bit afterwards, if that was, um, yeah, I think there's there's some time, there'll be some time afterwards for, for a little bit, a uh, kind of smaller discussion with more involved questions. So thanks everybody for being here and thanks Dr. Penn. Yeah, thank you all. Um, that was a lot of fun. So